This morning we are in the Gospel of Matthew once again, Matthew chapter 13, this series entitled Our King Jesus. This chapter, as you know, has been uh, a series of parables by Jesus. And today we come to the final installment, the last section. In fact, there's three parables about the kingdom and then one additional parable that Jesus tacks on and includes at the end. And we want to listen closely to that one as well. So we begin in Matthew 13, verse 44, and we'll read through the end of verse 52. So let me encourage you to follow along, and then I'll ask that you join me in prayer. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers. But the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, therefore... Every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Will you pray? Now, Father, as we come to this portion of your holy and inspired and authoritative word, we sit as hungry children needing to be fed. We sit as poor beggars needing your riches. We sit, Father, as sinful men and women needing afresh and anew to know and understand your grace and to better appreciate your kingdom. And Father, we pray in this room and in this place in our hearts that your spirit would reign And call us out into greater understanding and obedience for you. Thank you, Father, for this passage. Now may it teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For over a decade now, the credit card company, MasterCard, has been airing a series of commercials that have become somewhat iconic with the brand MasterCard. I'm sure you've all seen the commercials. They begin by following what appears to be the rather mundane purchase history of an individual. You see them at the gas station pumping gas, and all of a sudden the voiceover comes and it says, full tank of gas, $60. You know these commercials? The next moment you see him in the, the toy section of the store there and his children are running around and they there pick up some beach balls and they look at each other and they go to check out and it says, new beach ball, $7. And then they make several other stops along the way until you come to the final scene. And there the family's running along the beach and the kids are splashing in the waves and the wife is smiling and hugging her husband and The world is just perfect, you know. And the voice comes over and says, making memories at the beach with your family, priceless. And then, of course, the great MasterCard tagline, uh, for for some things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's MasterCard. And all of a sudden, we feel guilty about using our Discover card, you know. (laughs) We have shortchanged our family of these great memories if... Only we had used our MasterCard. We've all seen those commercials, I suspect. They've been running for for many, many years. 
And really there is a, an element of truth to that last scene in those commercials. We would all admit there are moments in our life, memories, occasions, that to us, they're priceless. There are memories that you have. Maybe it was the birth of your first child. Maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was the day you graduated school or, or, or the day you got your first job. There are things that you look back in on life and, and you wouldn't trade those memories, those moments for anything. If you've ever played the, the sort of what would you do game and somebody asks, so if your house was on fire, what five things would you say? Well, the first one we all say is family. Number two is what? Pets. Get Fido and Fluffy out, you know. Number three, though, inevitably, it's not like my refrigerator because I just love my, you know. No, what do you say? My, my wedding album, my scrapbook, these, these pictures that we have. And even though the, 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 the pictures, the, the piece of paper and the ink on it are probably not worth a few pennies, what they represent, you really can't put a price tag on. It's valuable, and in many ways, it's priceless. The reason we have these things, whether it's wedding day memorabilia or whatnot, we, the reason they have value is not because they're actually worth a lot in most cases. It's because they have what we call sentimental value. Because to us, it reminds us of something. It makes us nostalgic and longing for a different time, a, a special event. And no doubt, every single one of us in this room, we have elements and things in our life that in that way seem priceless. In our text this morning, however, the Lord Jesus is going to remind us that as priceless as those wedding photos may seem, as priceless as that other memorabilia may seem, there is something that is even more valuable. And that something is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus reminds us in these first two parables that the kingdom of heaven is indeed priceless. You cannot put a value on it. And in fact, if given the opportunity, you could exchange everything that you have to get the kingdom, it would be a trade-off worth making. He reminds us in this text that the kingdom of heaven, it is indeed priceless, not because it has sentimental value, not because the kingdom of heaven is something nostalgic or something that's, that's from our childhood. He tells us here that the reason the kingdom of heaven is so priceless is because it has eternal value. That nothing else can come close to. Nothing else can replace. Nothing else can make the kind of impact for eternity's sake that the kingdom of heaven can make. And in many ways, these parables here, Jesus sort of pushes us, if you will, into a corner and confronts us with the question, what is it that you value the most? Some of us have given the opportunity to, 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 to invest in this company. We would do it in a heartbeat. Some of us have given the opportunity to, to buy this thing. We would do it in a heartbeat or to, to be a part of this. And we value certain things. And Jesus would remind us, but what do you value the most. Is the kingdom of heaven on that list even? And if so, where does it rank? He reminds us how invaluable the kingdom of heaven truly is. Now, as we've been going through Matthew chapter 13, we've seen several parables about the kingdom of heaven. And we need to briefly review what we've seen in previous weeks. Jesus has given several parables about the kingdom of heaven. Now, we just explained that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonyms in the Gospels, referring to the same kingdom. In fact, another word that you can use for kingdom uh, is in one of our songs this morning, the word empire. My kids are big uh, Star Wars fans. Talk about God's empire. They think there's lightsabers you know, involved or something like that. I don't know. But um, it really, it's a place where the king rules, a place where the king reigns. And Jesus has been describing to us what the kingdom of heaven is like. And we define the kingdom of heaven by using the Lord's Prayer. You remember, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we said that generically speaking, the kingdom of heaven is that place where God's will is being done. 
It may take place in, in your heart as an individual. The kingdom may manifest itself, no doubt, in the life of the church. But it's also a little bit bigger than just a local church. It's, it's cross-denominational. It's the, it's the totality of God's redemptive activity in the world. Everything that He is doing where the lordship and the kingship of Christ is shown in families, in parachurch groups, in, in various other institutions that are working for the sake of the kingdom. This is, is the totality of the kingdom of heaven. And he says each one of us have an opportunity to be a part of it. Now what's interesting is Jesus has told us there's a, a thing about the kingdom that we find confusing. There's a sense in which the kingdom is already, but there's also a sense in which the kingdom is not yet. In Luke chapter 17, I believe it is, Jesus there talking to the disciples and said some people are going to say, hey, the kingdom's here, the kingdom's there. And Jesus said, no, 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 the kingdom is in your midst. So there's a sense in which the, the kingship of Christ, the will of God is being done in little pockets in our world today, is it not? In local churches, in congregations, in families, when we sit down and we pray and we teach our children truth and when we witness to that guy next door, when we're doing these things, it's little glows, little manifestations of the kingdom. But we're looking forward to a day when Christ returns and the kingdom is not sort of present intermittently, but all of a sudden now the kingdom is present globally. And Christ is ruling and reigning, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And so we look forward to that day, knowing that we have a responsibility now to live out the kingdom. To pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in my life, in my home, in what I do. Jesus reminds us that the kingdom is the full plan of what God is doing in the world. And in last week's text, you remember, we saw two little parables, the parable of the mustard seed and then the parable of the leaven. And in these, we saw that the kingdom of heaven, on the one hand, it's, it's invincible like that mustard seed or, or also like the, the wheat among the tares. It's going to grow up, even though it seems so small and so tiny and so insignificant, even though the whole thing started with just 12 men. It has grown up under God's direction and, and the kingdom is continuing to grow. And he tells us in that sense, it's, it's invincible. He also tells us when talking about the leaven, like, like leaven in dough, it, in some ways the kingdom, it's, it's invisible. You can't always put your finger on it. You know, it, the, the sad reality is just because a building has a steeple doesn't make it a church. And there are some who may have steeples on the building, but they're not even part of the kingdom. And so Jesus would call us to be discerning. Just, it's not always about the exterior. The kingdom is secretly moving and working, and God's plan is unfolding, and he is doing this, and we are to be obedient. We are to be a part of it. He tells us the kingdom is invincible. It's also invisible. And in today's text, he reminds us it is invaluable. It is worth more than anything you can imagine. And the first two parables that he gives to us here reminds us of this truth. Let's consider these first two parables, the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl. In the first one, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven, he says, is like. Now again, a comparison here. All these parables are illustrations of what the kingdom is like. It is like a treasure hidden in the field. Now pause there for a moment. That sounds kind of odd to us. You know, to us, hidden treasure is like, you know, something from a pirate movie. Arr, you know, hidden treasure. He, he says here, it's, it's like treasure hidden in a field. And that, that doesn't really resonate with us because that's not part of our world. But in, in a first century world, when you didn't have banks or credit unions, this is exactly how you kept your money safe. Remember the parable of the talents Jesus tells elsewhere? One of the men goes and he buries it because that's going to keep it safe. There was no FDIC to insure your investments. And so you had to do something. So this is the way they stuffed the money under the mattress. They would go dig a hole and hide it. And so this man is out in this field, and there he's, it seems to be digging along. This treasure is hidden. And it says that the man found it, and he hid it again. Now, we don't know what he was doing. Jesus doesn't tell us all that. Maybe he was digging a grave for his dog that died or something. We don't know. But he was out there doing something and stumbles across this treasure. And he immediately takes it. Notice what does he do? He buries it. Puts it right back in the ground and covers it up. 
And then notice what he says. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He, he runs home. He says, honey, get on eBay. We're selling all of our stuff. List it all. Call the auctioneer. We're selling it all off. Everything is going to be listed. Everything is for sale. And then he takes the proceeds of everything that he has, and he goes down to the real estate office, and he says, ma'am, is that lot over there still for sale? Well, yes, it is. I'd like to buy it. Here's everything that I own. I want that lot. Well, well, sir, you know we have better lots out there. No, 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 no. I want that lot. Well, but, sir, you realize there's some prime real estate over there. No, 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 no. I want that lot. And with a big, goofy grin on his face, he's insistent that he get that lot. Why? Because he knows that there the treasure is hidden. Now, some people get really bad out of shape over this parable because the, the, the legalist inside of us go, but wait a minute, that wasn't his field in the first place, and he shouldn't have took that. And you know, Jesus is not concerned with the legality or the morality of what this man does. Jesus' point is, you would be an idiot not to do the same thing. Really. His point is, if you had the opportunity to sell what measly things you had in, in, for a great treasure that would take care of you and your family, no doubt, for generations, of course it would be worth to exchange what piddly things you have for that. And Jesus says, that's what the kingdom is like. It doesn't matter what you have to sacrifice on this side. It's worth it. It's priceless. He gives a second parable that teaches the exact same lesson, but just with different figures and and characters. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Uh, This man seems to be some kind of jeweler, we might say, who's buying pearls, and he's, he's looking for them. Verse 46, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, very similar story. Now, we hear this guy finding a pearl, and that doesn't impress us as much, but if you think of it in our world, the, the, the analogy would be a diamond. The, the man, this jeweler, you know, some, it's like some guy comes into the jewelry store, and he puts down a box of, uh, an old jewelry box, and he says, look, my, my, my grandma died, there's no other family, I inherited this, I don't know what's in it, go through it and make me an offer, and I'll sell it to you. I just want the cash, I don't really want what's here. And you can just imagine the jeweler saying, okay, and he opens it up and puts his little thing on and pulls out a diamond, looks at it, wow, that's a half a carat diamond. He finds a pendant and puts it, oh, look at that. That is a full, that's a one carat diamond. And then he puts it down and he's rumbling through it. And there, to his absolute astonishment, is something ridiculous. Like at the bottom of it is like a 47 carat diamond. I mean, just unimaginably huge. And he says, whoa. And he walks over to the guy and says, listen, if you will sell me that one diamond, I will give you my jewelry store, my house, and my Lexus. You can have it all if I can have that one diamond. Jesus says that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Even if it seems like it costs you everything this size of heaven, it is worth it in the end. Can you put a price tag on forgiveness? Can you put a price tag on a clean conscience? Can you put a price tag on knowing the love of God? No, that's why he says it is, it is worth any amount of sacrifice this side of heaven to be a part and to possess the kingdom of heaven. You see, one of the reasons I think in both of these parables, the reason that the kingdom is so valuable is because of how rare and one of a kind it is. He says that in the first one there, that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. If I learn anything from the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, there's not a whole lot of hidden treasure out there, right? Just a few of them. They're rare. In the second story, he spells it out more clearly, upon finding one pearl of great value. He says it's, it's, it's one of a kind. It's unlike anything else, and it needs to be taken. We understand that, that generally the, the, the more rare something is, the more valuable it is. If you can find it at the dollar store, it's probably not that valuable. But if you can only find it at the Smithsonian, that's going to be worth it. 
And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that. It is so rare and it is so one of a kind. This is the only place that you can get it. Listen to me, church. There is a need for us today as God's people to understand, to defend, and to proclaim afresh and anew the exclusivity of Christ. We live in a world where everything is a pearl. Everything is valuable. Everybody's ideas are the same. And yet Jesus would remind us, no, 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 that is not the case. As Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Second Timothy tells us there is one God and but one mediator between God and man. That is the man, Christ Jesus. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. One reason it is so valuable is because it's the only place you can get it. It's by coming to faith in Christ. He says here it's, it's one of a kind. And even though the world may think that we are narrow-minded, knuckle-dragon bigots, we are doing the world a favor by reminding them and proclaiming that there is salvation in no other name. I think he also reminds us here, by the way, that men and women of the kingdom will be motivated by joy. Did you see that in the middle of the first story? The man, he, he, he finds the treasure, hides it, and then it says in verse 44, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has. He does it out of joy. How often, let's be honest, does our Christian living sort of start in joy and then it degenerates into duty? Ah, uh, Sunday. I gotta go to church. I gotta read my Bible. It's Monday. The pastor made us feel guilty yesterday in church talking about reading your Bible. You know, it's meal time. Let's uh, oh, uh, let's pray. I'm supposed to do that, I guess. And sometimes it degenerates into duty. But Jesus reminds us, no, 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 no. Men and women of the kingdom, when they understand how valuable it is. Their obedience is out of joy. Their obedience is out of excitement for the grace of God. What is it that lies at the bottom of your obedience to Christ? Is it, is it duty? Is it, is it out of a grudge? Like are you doing it begrudgingly? Or are you motivated by understanding the grace of God that apart from Christ you would have nothing? And if you have received by faith the gift of Christ, then you have everything. I've mentioned before a book that's just it's come out a little bit longer. Um, it's entitled Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything. That sums it up. He says here it's, 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 it's worth giving up everything. I think he also reminds us here, even though we do this out of joy, that men and women of the kingdom of heaven, we will make sacrifices. It's not a trite thing. It's not a notice in both stories. This is the one constant in both stories. In the first story, he sells all that he has and buys that field. Then look in verse 46. He went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now he's not saying here that you can buy your way into heaven. The scripture makes that abundantly clear elsewhere. The analogy here, though, is that this man he's allowed to have personal ownership. You know, you don't come into the you don't come into the kingdom of God by proxy because your parents were good Christians. Oh, you just sort of become one. No, you have to personally take ownership of the kingdom of Christ. You have to personally repent of your sins and come in faith to him. And in doing that, in making that exchange, he says sir, that you now are a rightful owner of these things. But it may, his point here, is that very well may require sacrifice. My friends, listen, if you have a Jesus who doesn't every once in a while mess up your schedule, if you have a Jesus who doesn't every once in a while take over your to-do list, if you have a Jesus who doesn't make demands of your checkbook, then you don't have King Jesus. King Jesus will exercise his authority. Listen, sometimes being a member of the kingdom of God, it is very inconvenient. That sometimes it calls us to sell everything that we have. Understanding and knowing what awaits us is even better, even more valuable. Do you just have sort of your life and Jesus just sort of, all right, I'll sort of fit him in right here because i got a little bit of time. Or does he sit as king 
over all of your doings and all of your comings and all of your goings? Does he sit over all of these as king, as Lord over these and directing and guiding your path? He reminds us of the sacrifice that comes, that is involved with being a part of the kingdom. Why is it so valuable? Why is it worth this trade-off of selling everything to have it? Well, interestingly, the next parable makes it even more clear. In the next parable, Jesus reminds us, listen, the reason it's worth this exchange, the reason the kingdom of heaven is priceless is because what is at stake. And his point in the next parable is eternity is at stake. He says here, the reason it is so valuable is because what you stand to gain or lose in the end. And Jesus gives this apocalyptic picture of the end times and of the final day of judgment. He says in verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea. I wouldn't know what a dragnet was, but one time on vacation I watched an episode of Big Shrimpin' or something like that, you know? You guys seen that show? They got these big old nets that they drag behind the boats and, you know, pick up. But it doesn't just pick up shrimp, right? It picks up everything. And that's what he says here. It, it's cast into the sea and it gathers fish of every kind. By the way, for anybody interested, that's a, a little play on words there. It's normally the word that we translate kind. It's normally translated like um, like nationality. It's, it's normally applied to people in terms of like almost like race. He's like, there'll be fish of all races there, fish of all nationalities that are gathered. The implication, of course, is people. Verse 48, and when it's filled, the the net, they drew it in on the beach, sat down, gathered the fish into good containers, the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. Jesus uses a a familiar parable that the, 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 the disciples would have known, understand. They would have done this hundreds of times in their own life, going through, dragging the net, getting the fish, and and separating them. The good fish go here. The bad fish go here. And then Jesus tells us what the purpose of that is. He says, listen, this is what you stand to gain or lose ultimately with the kingdom of heaven. So it will be, verse 49, at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus gets gets down to brass tacks. He says, here's what you stand to lose. If you don't pursue the kingdom, if you don't exchange all, if you don't embrace the kingship of Christ, what you stand to lose is at the end of the age, you will be counted among the wicked who will be cast into the furnace of fire. I said this last week, but Jesus used the same point again. Some people will say, wait a minute. We're not supposed to take this stuff literally because this is, a, this is a parable, right? No, the parable stopped in verse 48. The explanation of the, the theology behind the parable starts in verse 49. This is not the, 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 the allegory anymore. This is the truth behind it. And he says the truth behind it, the fish that get thrown away, are like the wicked cast into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of tea. In that place there will be wailing and grieving and sorrow. There will be no one that spends their time in hell happy about their decision. He also says there will be gnashing of teeth. That's one of those good Bible phrases. What does he mean by that, gnashing of teeth? A couple of weeks ago I had a splinter in my hand and I'm kind of a uh, wimp when it comes to those things. So I told my wife, I said, I want you to take it out. I said, okay. So I gave her my hand, and I'm doing this, you know. And she says, okay, you ready? And I'm going, yeah, go ahead. And she says, I haven't even started yet. I said, I know. <laughs> Why was I doing that? Why was I, I, I was gritting my teeth. Why? Because you grit your teeth anticipating pain. He says that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is not a pretty picture of what eternity holds for the wicked. And Jesus says, this is what you stand to lose. If you don't make this exchange that he talked about, and if you don't embrace the kingdom, what you stand to lose is your eternal destiny. He reminds us here that it is irrevocable. You know, I know that that, that some of you, you're you're sitting here thinking, okay, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to die one day and I'm going to be judged. But I'm going to walk out of this room and get in my car and I'm going to go out. 
And there's still the sun's still going to be shining. I'm going to go eat lunch. I'm going to go to my job tomorrow. Everything's going to be great. And life is just going to continue. But the point that Jesus is making is it's not going to always be that way. The end of the age is coming. And when that comes, your eternal state is irrevocable. It's settled. And Jesus says, this is what you stand to lose. My friend, do you find yourself in that place? Does the prospect of death and eternity, does it frighten you? Or does it comfort you? And if it frightens you, I beg you to repent and believe in Christ. That is the only hope that we have. He says there, then that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says the reason it's okay to exchange everything for the pearl and for the treasure is because the kingdom of heaven is valuable. Why is it valuable? Because what's at stake? Eternity is at stake. So knowing these two things, now what do we do? That's the next part, verse 51. Jesus asked the disciples, have you understood all these things, or, or the Greek literally, have you put together, it's like a puzzle, have you put the puzzle together, guys? And what do they answer? Verse 51, they said to him, yes. I think this is one of those yeses, like, you ever been in, you know, like, chemistry class, and the teacher writes a really complex form on the board, and says, all right, if you understand this, raise your hand, and you're going, don't call on me, please, don't call on me, please, don't call on me, please, you know. You understand it, but you really don't understand it, you know. I think there are some things in the Gospels that may show that that's what the disciples were doing here. But nevertheless, they say, yes, we understand these things. So Jesus says, okay, if you understand how valuable the, the kingdom is, and you understand what's at stake, what is your responsibility? Verse 52, and Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now, a scribe, as you know, was uh, they, they spent their time scribbling. They were writing. They were copying the Old Testament. These guys were experts in the law, very often teachers of the law. They knew the, the Old Testament really, really well. And so he gives us this great picture. He says, a scribe who's, who, who's, whose feet are both planted in the Old Testament becomes a disciple of the kingdom. And, and the implication here, the kingdom, all these teachings about the kingdom, is something new. Not something, something, um, not something to replace it, but something new that sheds light on it. And so the man who was the scribe here, who was steeped in the Old Testament, now becomes a disciple of the kingdom here. And now he has a responsibility instead of standing here, or standing here, he's got to stand here. He's got his feet firmly planted in here, understanding the old things, how the Old Testament came about, and what it taught us about God, and sin, and death, and judgment. And he is to understand all of that now in light of the fuller understanding about the kingdom. And what all of this ultimately means. This is a reminder in, in, in small part to remember, read your Old Testament and your New Testament. And keep them in balance. Understand one in light of the other. He says here, this, this, this one is one who comes, and, and he's like a head of a household. Now, notice what the head of a household does. He brings out of his treasure things new and old. What's the point here? It's actually quite simple. He says here, the one who comes into the kingdom, and even though... These disciples and others, they, all they knew was sort of the Old Testament. He says, now you understand the New Testament. Put it all together, and you're like a head of a household, like a, a father in a family who, who goes back and he pulls out things out of the treasure chest, and he puts them on display, and he shows the children. You know, I, I have a, a little, I'm not even sure it's an heirloom of sorts, but it's a little bit rare, um, passed down from some family that we got. I have a first edition copy of the record meet the beatles and it's still in the plastic wrap or one of the some family members bought it and never opened it and uh so i i keep it but i don't keep it out on the coffee table I keep it in the closet and i'll tell somebody sometimes hey you know i've got that record and they'll say no you don't yeah i do let me go get it for you, you know? 
And I bring it out and I show them. He says, the man who, who, who understands the kingdom, who understands that it's priceless, who understands what's at stake, he has a responsibility now, like a father would bring his children there and say, kids, let me show you your inheritance. Let me show you what's here. He, he, he comes and he shares it now with others. Do you see that? If we have come into the kingdom and we understand the, the, the treasure that we have in Christ, Jesus' point is, don't keep it to yourself. Go share it with others. Show it to others. Help them to understand the old and the new and the valuable that we have in Jesus. And make these things known. He's like a head of a household who brings it out. My friend, in your life, do you put Christ and His value on display for others to see? Do people know that's what you treasure the most? He calls us here not to keep it to ourselves, but to share it with others. You say, yeah, I know, but if I I share my faith with others, if I talk about Jesus, it, it might cost me some friendships. It might cost me my reputation. It might even cost me my job. It might cost me these these other things if I take a stand for this. It's going to cost me this and cost me this and cost me this and cost me this. Yes, but the whole point is that the exchange at the end, your reward is priceless. Even though it may cost us a great deal, what Christ has reserved for us, what we have in the kingdom, you can't put a price tag on. And even if it costs us everything, it's worth it. Would you pray? Our Father, we thank you for your word this morning. It is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Father, we thank you for these three steps that we have learned, that your kingdom is priceless, that it's priceless because of its eternal value, And we know that not only because of that, but we have a responsibility to now share it with others. Father, we ask and we pray that each of us might feel the urgency to share Christ with those around us. And Father, may we start with our own household, as the parable would say. With our own children. With our own family. With our brothers and sisters. Nieces and nephews. To show them the treasure of Christ from the old and the new. And Father, we pray that you'll find us faithful in this this week. Lord, remind us to live today in light of eternity. To remember that the end of the age is coming. And may it grant us urgency about our conversations and our relationships so that others might know Jesus. Father, thank you for this reminder. We give ourselves to you afresh and anew. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.